You know what? Sticks and stones will break your bones, but failure will get you killed. Time to once again sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. I wasn't a dumbass like so many other punks my age. I had managed to avoid juvie, though not foster parents. I had no say in the latter. I wasn't born into tragedy or a broken home, just normal folks who lived and worked in the big city. They also died in that city in an apartment fire, so the tragedy and broken home hadn't come until I was eleven. Real shame. They were nice people, and no, I didn't have a hand in it. I was riding bikes down at the local park with some of my friends. We all hooped and yelled as the fire trucks and ambulances rolled by the playground. Then another group of them passed. It was something big. One of my friends pointed toward the area where my home was and at the black billowing column of smoke that rose in the clear early summer sky. Other buildings obscured a direct view, but the direction he pointed was about right for the apartment complex where I lived. I looked over my shoulder. <sighs> Can't be. Close, but no way. Bet mum and dad have a great view, though. I tried to convince myself. After a short discussion, we decided to ride down to see for ourselves. Several of us lived at the same apartment complex, and we eyed one another in concern. One of the boys said excitedly, Maybe it's a school. The rest of us cheered, but I already knew better. I had that sensation of my heart sinking in my chest until it fluttered feebly rather than beat its normal solid rhythm. This was about to be the worst day of my life so far, but hey, I was only eleven and a half. Many years ahead, right? As we got closer, I tore out ahead of the rest, my legs pumping the pedals as hard as I could. The entire building was engulfed. There were several residents standing around, some in shock, some craning for a view into the dark orange flames and black, oh, so black smoke. I looked and called for my folks. When I didn't see them, I started to run toward the building, but one of the neighbours, an older man, Mr. Gosling, grabbed me. Stop, Robbie. You can't do anything there but get hurt. I strained for a moment, but then collapsed back against him. Maybe they weren't inside. Maybe they'd gone out, I thought desperately, looking for an escape from the horrid reality before my senses. Mr. Gosling patted my shoulder. You're safe, Robbie. I'll just have to wait and see. I'm sure your parents are safe too. I'll wait with you. Well, the rest of it's just stuff. It's lives that matter. I don't think I ever really thanked him for that. He was a nice old man. Retired from the army. Always polite to mum. Well, they weren't safe. No one had been inside that building at 2.36pm that day was. Some kind of gas leak. I never really cared to learn. I only know that it took my folks from me. The rest of that day and many to follow were a blur. The survivors, refugees, were put into a shelter. I was a juvenile, but with all the mess and it being late on a Saturday, Child Protective Services let Mr. Gosling take responsibility for me and help me find my next of kin. Well, the only ones I knew of were an aunt and an uncle on my mum's side, her sister. Dad's folks were dead and he was an only child. Moms lived across the country, and we heard from them only on birthdays and holidays. So, I ended up with Aunt Tabitha and Uncle James, at least for the summer. They decided that they just couldn't take care of a mopey, sometimes angry tween, and just after the funeral, my faraway grandparents had gone silent and remained far away and unreachable. So I entered the loving arms of the government by way of the good folks at CPS. I know... You expect me to relate horror stories of abusive foster parents and give excuses for why I turned out to be such a turd. Yeah, in the sing-song, pathetic falsetto, well, I was put through an uncaring system and treated savagely. Yeah, yeah, it's not my fault that I now steal and transport drugs. Well, nope. My parents were good people and raised me to pity victims rather than to be one. Besides, most of the fosters were okay, despite being involved with the government. I was the one who caused the problems. I did everything I could to keep each of them at a distance from day one. My stays usually lasted around six months. The ones that went longer had to do with CPS having to find fosters who were willing to take on a problem child. 
most of them just wanted the extra income that the state paid for being, as their advertisements claimed, caring foster parents for children in need. Well, that didn't make them bad people, but I never stayed in a mansion or even a nice suburb. I didn't care. I didn't need anyone. I could take care of myself. Developed a detachment for possessing material goods once all of mine had been instantly destroyed. Yet I enjoyed the finer things and having them, at least temporarily, until I could find a direct buyer or a fence. I think that the loss of my personal property caused me to lose empathy regarding things. I just didn't value property. Why should anyone else? That made it easier to steal, and it was, after all, just stuff, as Mr. Gosling had said. It was hard at first to turn over items for a profit, but I learned. I also learned not to steal from fosters unless I was ready to kick rocks. I didn't get into dope or booze. I'd lived around enough rough neighborhoods to see what it did to people. However, I had picked up some friends who were dealers and not averse to teaching a juvie how to hold for them and later to transport. By age 17, I still rode bikes and I wasn't scared of much. Losing all the people for whom you truly care can free one from most fear. What's left? My life. What adolescent truly values his life. It's why the military hire teens. No decent sense of self-preservation. So, I put mine at risk regularly. Transporting drugs was easier, less risky on a day-to-day -day basis, and more profitable than thievery. Not that I stopped stealing entirely. Sometimes an item was too nice and too easily obtained by way of careless former owners to pass up on. All of the Fosters eventually knew me as a thief and a liar, and the religious ones hammered at me about getting on a straight and narrow path, or looking for the light. But none ever caught on to the drug smuggling from murderous gangsters. The dealers liked me. I was never curious as to what I carried or what business they might be doing. I dressed like any innocent kid. No tattoos, piercings, freaky hair, or anything that would draw official attention or adult ire. I had the good sense to ride safely, and I could lie like a rogue. Someone once told me I had innocent eyes. <laughs> Whatever, as long as they helped me weasel out of trouble. So, that's the general scoop. I was happy that I'd soon be free of the foster care system and CPS. I was ready to close out the current last fosters, the Hearns. So I took some items from the lady's jewelry box. A big, gaudy, wooden thing with carved, curvy knots and vines interwoven all over the polished surface. Too bad I'd have to leave it in place. I knew a fence who would pay well for that. It would resell as a storage box for some rich dude's personal stash of drugs or his little equalizer. Well, while these Fosters hadn't been thumpers, they were still straight and narrow types when it came to moral behavioral issues. She prattled on about being a responsible citizen. He hadn't said much, but I knew the look, the one that grown men gave me, a mix of pity, disgust, and contempt. I generally didn't care what anyone thought of me. Who were they to judge? They claimed to be Roman Catholic, but I never saw them go to Mass, nor had they ever dragged me to church for which I was grateful. Oh, probably catch fire or something. I made good money as a courier between gangs and other crooks, though I decided that I wanted to look into other criminal activity. Maybe cyber crimes. I'd learned to fight on the street, and, and thanks to the philosophy of some of my fosters that martial arts would teach me, I learned discipline. I worked hard at it, and I became a very disciplined criminal. These days I carried a knife on me at all times, since being a courier could be dangerous. But I knew that robbing people or burglarizing homes was super high risk. If I had to cut anybody, I'd be tracked down like a dog. So many choices, though. Just shy of 18 years, I knew I had absolutely more wisdom than anyone else. I had to. So many had let me steal from them. I'd skated past the scrutiny of every adult until I chose to get caught. No foster had ever turned me into the authorities. I convinced them how sorry I was and how I'd make it up to them. I was looking at a great life ahead. Right. Well, they say that pride goeth before a fall. I wish it did. I'd have had something better to land on than the pavement. The thing is, I didn't fall. I was knocked off my bike and sprawled onto the pavement. I fell well. I'd done it many times. Nothing worse than some road rash on my left forearm and a bruised left knee. What worried me was the ringing I heard in my ears, 
and the pain coming from the right side of my head. I was pretty sure that the wet substance now sliding around the side of my face was blood. A rotten bastard. Probably some dirty wine bottle. Thought I heard it clink. Well, I shook off the shock and started to scramble to my feet, but no such luck. Oomph. There went my wind as a boot connected with my midsection. I rolled and managed to come up on my feet, though still bent forward and on wobbly legs. I tried to see what was happening, and I held up my hands in a feeble attempt to locate and fend off my attacker. Oh, dang. Attackers. I saw another one approach from around the front of my bike. That momentary distraction saved me, though. As I turned toward the second, first missed his swing at my jaw and connected instead with my shoulder. I lashed out in a sidekick that caught his left knee and he went down. Not sure how I did that in my condition, but hey, thanks for the funk jitsu lessons, Fosters. Number two pushed me and I once again sprawled. This time on my button, this time I was able to roll away a few extra feet. Good thing. He stepped forward with a knife in hand. I was curled up as though I was scared. Okay, maybe I was a little, instinct and all. And he went for it. Stepped closer and bent forward to get in a stick with a knife. I let him have it in the face with both feet. He went over backward, and again I was rolling. Then once more back on my feet, a little dizzy but beginning to catch my breath. Number one had recovered and was reaching behind his back, very obviously for a weapon. I ran forward and planted my right knee in his gut as he pulled out a small pistol. I was able to catch hold of his wrist and pull it to my chest. I bent forward and twisted. Once his elbow locked, I stepped back and hammered it with my left fist. Snap, went the joint. Ah, uh, went Pistol Pete. Dunk, went the crappy pistol onto the pavement. I pushed him to the ground where he curled around his injury and I picked up his pistol. I started to point it at number two, who had risen and was closing in with his knife. He was too close. I had no time to even raise it fully, but I pressed the trigger and the loud crack of the pistol sounded as his blade sliced into my left forearm over the road rash. I managed not to scream, but that was only out of adrenaline and the clenching of my teeth. I made for a nice grunting growl, though. It sounded tough enough to me. I stepped back into the side as he advanced forward, but suddenly he collapsed. The blood stain was growing way too rapidly at the top of his right leg. I had hit his femoral artery and broken his pelvis. All I knew was that this situation was foobard. Yeah, I got that from some movie or trashy novel. Maybe Mr. Gosling. Well, I looked more closely at my two new friends. Mr. Broken Arm, formerly Pistol Pete. I'd recovered enough to start screaming. Oh shit, oh, fuck. Repeatedly, and in that order. A bleeding guy lay there, clutching his groin and praying. Mm. I had to get the noise to stop. It would draw attention. You know, people could dismiss a single gunshot. But a shot followed by screaming, well, some good citizen would call, Get some 911 up in here. So I did the best thing I could think of, and kicked a field goal with the screamer's face. It got him to stop yelling and gave me a moment to study the situation. I looked back at the bleeder. His head was back and the blood was starting to pool. So much blood. Then I recognized him. He was a member of one of the local gangs who called himself Aranya, Spider. He had a tattoo of a black widow spider on his neck. I guess he didn't know it was a female spider. That would mean that the other one was fail, ugly since they constantly worked and hung out together. Fayo was pretty ugly to start. Facial tats and piercings didn't help, nor had the kick I delivered improved his features. I casually pointed the pistol at his unsavory countenance and asked simply, Why? He leaned forward, clutching at his arm, spat out a tooth and lisped. Oh, you dead motherfucker. We were just going to give you a beatdown. Oh, you fucked up though. Now you're going to be dead. I just continued to gaze, and I flicked the muzzle of the pistol upward to encourage him to answer my question. Jagger says, your last law was light. You get beat down because it's your first problem all. Oh, and Sonny and he crew are going to be dead. Oh, now you're dead too. Surprisingly, that's all the explanation I needed. 
Jaguar was the leader of Fio's branch of whatever trashy gang, and Sony was the leader of another trashy gang that supplied drugs and other criminal necessities to other gangs. I'd delivered for Sony for a few days past, and he or one of his thugs had hosed me when they hosed Jaguar. For that matter, Jaguar's turds may have hosed me. Oh, this was going to be bad for business. I didn't care if the gangs warred and killed one another, but that meant no regular business for a courier until it was straightened out and the relative peace was restored. Money was the primary motivation for criminal gangs, but they had to have street cred. A non-fatal hit on Sony or dusting a few low-level associates would be enough to satisfy what passed for honor and allow for a parley, as long as no one who mattered was dead. That's when I heard Arania's death rattle. Well, I'd heard one before, when a Foster's elderly relative died while we visited her in hospital. Foo. Bah. I didn't even look, just picked up my bike and flew. Yeah, run, mother. You're still gonna die, Fio screeched as I pedaled for my life. Literally, for my life. I pumped the pedals furiously and headed in the same direction I'd been going. I still had a delivery to make and it was to a party that was linked to neither Jaguar nor Sony. I know it's crazy, but when things go sideways, some odd notions pop up into the old melon. As I rode as hard as I could, I thought about what to do. Get rid of the gun? It might be handy to have it for protection, but... But I didn't like risking gun charges. Oh, after the delivery, where should I go? Should I warn Sony and crew? I didn't like to get that involved, and I certainly didn't want to take sides. I mean, I'd lose all my business. What would I do about Arania? Chances were that Jaguar's group would dispose of him unless they thought a gang funeral was in their best interests. Didn't have to worry too much that anyone would tell the police. They'd rather take care of it on their own. I should have off failed and figured out a way to dump both bodies. I'd have had that junky old ride with the stereo system and super bright headlights that were worth more than the car itself to haul away their carcasses. Foo. Bar. I'd likely have to blow town, but I needed to be clear of the Fosters and 18, so CPS didn't label me a runaway. Still a few weeks to go. Right, I'd keep the gun for now, but I needed to check the load and condition. Likely fail wouldn't have taken care of the thing. Right. Just a glitch or two. All I had to do was stay alive and avoid Jaguar's bunch for a while. Probably Sony's too, in case they wanted a scapegoat. Note to self. If I ever become a gang leader, pick a better hander than Jaguar or Sony. Maybe I could keep my current one. I made it to my delivery location and almost missed my contact in the dark and at my considerable speed. L looked at me oddly. <sighs> what up, Coyote? You know, like shit, dude. And that's when I realized I was exhausted from my mad ride and the sweat and blood on the side of my head must have looked pretty nasty. My arm must have looked even worse. Oh, no wonder no one else had accosted me. I probably looked pretty frightening. Not cool. Blood would draw official interest. I grinned and took my payment. Ah, you know, El. I cut it too close in front of a car and had to ditch. My bad, but I hurried over. I want to keep my customers happy. Yeah, I knew that was a lame answer, but my mind was racing again. I was trying to settle down and concentrate, but now that he mentioned it, my head did hurt. So did my arm. Well, he let it pass as your business. I thanked him for the payment and rode off in a new direction. I needed to change up my route. By now, Jaguar's crew would be on the hunt. No pun intended. He was named for the car, not the cat. Well, same as Sony was named for the stereos. Dumbass gang names. Well, I was named for a cartoon character, which was cool. First, I rode to a nearby park. It was closed at night, but there were some public restrooms behind a feeble fence. I could fade this one. Any cop or security guard that spotted me, I could claim a serious call of nature and face it. Nobody likes to talk about taking a dump. I slithered through a hole in the fence that most good citizens would not even have noticed. Fortunately, the lock on the structure was already busted. Yeah, some hood rat may already have had the same bright idea, so I proceeded with caution. I was alone and took a little break to get cleaned up, 
and do a preemptive strike on the actual call of nature. I took a look in the mirror after I'd cleaned my wounds. I needed a change of shirt. Too much blood. I took off my outer long sleeve, tore off the clean right sleeve and ditched the bloody mess in the trash. Clean side showing. No one would look closely in this neighborhood. Especially not a cleaning crew getting city pay. I was wearing a black wife beater underneath. Not great, but it'd have to do until I could snag something better. I used the relatively clean sleeve to bandage my left forearm. Definitely not good, but until I could get something better... Oh, crap. The reflection in the mirror showed a large, dark figure looming behind me. I stepped aside and turned to face him. It. Whatever. Nothing. I looked around. Still, nothing. Just a quick goose flesh inducing chill and a slight shiver. No one in the stalls and no one could have gotten out of the main door that quickly. Clearly my mind was playing tricks on me. I fled the facilities and resumed my ride. I knew of the thrift store nearby where you know, there were donation bins on the side of the building. Yeah, maybe I could get a shirt or jacket or something. Well, I didn't dare go into the local Wally World store. How many crooks get caught on camera? <laughs> the dumbass ones. Nobody bothered to monitor thrift stores. I just had to hope that the local homeless population hadn't beaten me to the best pickings. Wow. I realized I was competing with homeless people for resources. Yeah, I'd maybe have to reevaluate my life's calling. Definitely getting out of the drug courier business. At least in this town. Ah, bingo. Found it a faded but serviceable long sleeve work shirt in the bin. Things were looking up again. As I donned my new apparel, I thought I saw something move inside the shadows cast by the bin from the parking lot lights that were, amazingly, working. Maybe a dog or cat, but it seemed bigger. There had definitely been scratching noises from claws on asphalt. I felt a cold shiver. I was giving myself the creeps for no reason. Well, sure I'd killed someone and had a pack of gangsters after my blood. Gangsters known for their torture skills. Still... No reason to get freaked out. There were no large shadow figures on my trail, just my rattled, wine bottle bashed brain playing tricks. I stopped at a nearby convenience store to get a drink and an energy bar. I thought, well, I might also like to get some peroxide or rubbing alcohol to clean out the gash on my arm. Maybe even some gauze or something clean. Well, the place had one of those bulletproofish glass cages around the counter. Some dude was sitting behind the glass, jabbering into an ancient sofa. He gave me a glance and went back to his conversation. Just as well. No real scrutiny. I found what I needed and plopped everything on the counter. I had to hold up each item so he could scan them through the glass. He never really looked at me, just continued talking into the decrepit phone. The place smelled like someone had poured straight fabuloso on the floor over fresh urine and didn't bother mopping. The stench burned my nostrils and made me a little nauseous. I started to leave through the single battered but working glass door. The other was locked tight and blocked with a rack of off-brand chips. All to stop grab-and-go thefts and slow down robbers for the two obvious security cameras. I realized that I'd be walking from a brightly lit interior into darkness. There were stickers and advertisements plastered all over the glass, so I couldn't see outside. I paused to peer through the few open spaces on the none-too-clean glass. Just inky blackness. Weird. There should have at least been some lighting from the yellow-tinged pole light out front. Well, I pushed hard on the door to clear a path if need be. I ended up stumbling out onto the crumbling pavement of the sidewalk. I quickly looked in each direction. Nothing but the pole light and a bat chasing some insects near the bowl. Another shiver. It wasn't that cool outside, and the heavy work shirt was adequate for mid-September. But like earlier, this chill seemed to come up from my bones and radiate outwards. Oh, but my wounds already infected. Oh, what had been on our Anya's blade? Just regular crust, lightly. God, had he used it to cut drugs and failed to wipe it off when done? And then I was just freaked out again. Well, it had been a freaky night so far, and it was still early. I decided on a route back. Home to the Fosters. I'd have to cross my original trail back through Jaguar's territory, but maybe they had other targets tonight. Maybe Sony? Oh, who knows. 
I took off and rode toward my last foster home. As I went, I noticed that the street lights were working, but almost no light came from the businesses and homes on either side of the street. Weird. It wasn't late enough for people to go to bed, and besides, in this hood, nobody turned off outside lights. I'd hoped to take as many alleyways as possible to avoid car traffic. Cars that might hold angry gang turds. However, as I approached the first alleyway on my planned route, I saw that it was dark. Too dark to risk. The left-hand detour around it was also dimly lit. The right-hand street was clear. <laughs> no brainer. I turned right. I just have to adjust the plan a little. Yet as I rode along, all of the streets and alleyways that would have led me back to the left and back on track were either dark or obstructed in some way. Junk cars. Groups of random hood rats standing around burning trash cans. A couple of dumpsters. Damn, this was getting old. Up ahead, there was a larger avenue. It was well lit, and I saw a few vehicles go by in either direction. No choice. I'd have to risk the bigger, busier roadway. Well, the last alleyway I passed was full of what an old pulp novel I'd read referred to as Stygian gloom. Pure darkness. Like in a cavern. Hey, what were those eyes? Orange glowing eyes. Damn, I almost crashed into a parked garbage truck. Another chill. And this one wouldn't shake, so I picked up the pace to warm myself with exercise and put some distance between the alleyway and my body. As I made it to the wider, more brightly lit street, MLK, I was finally able to turn left. I realized that there was a plastic convenience store bag dangling from my right wrist. It was banging against the bike and throwing off my balance just a little. I pulled into a covered bus stop with shadows on one end, but mostly illuminated by a nearby streetlight. I took a much-needed seat and took care of my bod, not that I even tasted the empty calories I wolfed down. The bus stop and, indeed, the surrounding block was empty and silent. Cars went by at various speeds, but no one seemed to pay me any particular attention, just people going about in their evening. I'd found a small bottle of isopropyl alcohol at the store. I doused the wounds and the cheap gauze bandage I procured then wrapped and taped my arm. Damn, it stung like crazy, but it smelled good and made my arm feel warm. I used a little more to douse the cut on the side of my head. Just a pressure cut, but it was over a major goose egg lump that was painful to touch. I used a citrus tasting energy drink to wash down a couple of painkillers, then gobbled up a candy bar to chase down the chips I'd already finished. Well, the crappy store hadn't had any energy bars. God, what a dump. Junk food aside, I was feeling pretty satisfied that I'd handled my crisis and prepared to get back on the bike when I noticed that not only were there no people around, there was nothing living. No strays, no rats, no bats, not even any bugs. Except for the sounds of autos and the occasional dum 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 from the bass on their stereos. Nothing. Then the chill came rising up from my bones once more, and the shadows began to deepen and seemed to expand towards me. I heard a vague and distant rumbling sound, almost like thunder in my ears. The only way that remained lit was the direction I'd intended to travel, so I hopped on the bike and began to pedal. Not insanely fast, but I quickly geared up to a good speed. MLK was a large thoroughfare that led to places where people work for a living, so it was better maintained than most of the streets in the area. I cruised along until I was back near to where I'd run into Ariana and Fio. And then, I saw it. The black SUV that crept along across the street. The windows were dark tinted and the carriage was underlit in rotating colours. It was Jaguar's crew. I looked desperately for a place to ditch and hide. The ditch! I rolled my bike into the ditch along the side of the road, laid it flat and stretched out prone beside it. Well, the grass was damp and muddy, but it beat being spotted by those animals certainly beat having old tyres thrown over my still-breathing body and set on fire. Oh, I couldn't risk getting up to look around, so I just laid there, panting, whispering over and over. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Naturally, they turned onto MLK and headed in my direction. Oh, foobar. I ducked my head into the wet grass and stiffened. They drove by slowly, but, but no more so than they'd be travelling on the cross street. Oh, they kept going. 
It was hard, but I waited. This block was the only nearby stretch that was ditch rather than sidewalk. I needed them to get far enough away that they wouldn't look back. Hopefully they'd turn and I'd be out of their line of sight. But no, they kept going. Eventually I felt like I could safely get up and get going. Not too far to go now. I hopped on and started pedaling. I knew I had to change roads in case the searchers turned back. Besides, I had to go a few more blocks to the west, my left, to get back to my foster's neighbourhood. I started looking for a well-lit left turn off of MLK, but all the ways were either blacked out dark or blocked in some way. Then I caught a flash of light out of the corner of my eye. I looked over my shoulder. Foo, bar indeed. It was Feo's beater with the super bright headlights. I heard the engine roar as whoever was driving floored the gas pedal. Couldn't be Feo. That idiot had a broken arm. <laughs> well, I had no choice. I had to get off the road. I turned into an alley that had been shrouded in darkness. Now a door opened on one side and enough light streamed out that I was able to ride full speed ahead. Feo's ride wouldn't be able to fit, but I didn't want to catch a bullet in the back. I rode until I found a cross street that was lit. God, what's going on with the lights in this town? I tore up the street and followed the path of light down several more twists and turns. All the while I tried to stay on narrow streets and alleys. I could hear Tyus screeching several times as Phil, his new driver, the old one was dead, and I walked through that part of the city on our little game of cat and mouse. Unfortunately, I was the mouse. I dodged him again by fleeing into a narrow, dark alley. This time there was no light, and I was sure I'd find a place to hide or run in a direction where they couldn't see. I was feeling giddy and started to laugh when I slammed into the front driver's quarter panel of the black SUV. I went over the handlebars and slid across the hood. Oh, great. Hood rats really loved their rides. Burning tires for me, I thought. At least sliding across the hood was better than slamming into the pavement. I rolled off the hood onto the pavement on the passenger side, mostly on my feet. I was momentarily confused. How did I manage to do that? Why wasn't I already dead? Well, I hope there's a surveillance video. This would look great on social media, or news media if they whack me on the spot. I steadied my stance and stood erect to see around me, looking desperately for a place to run. Big Ray unfolded himself from the passenger side of the SUV, and his scorpion, Jaguar's main enforcer, leapt from the driver's side, clearly infuriated. I am fucked, I thought. These guys were full-on badass murder for hire gangsters. Then, another door opened in another nearby wall, and light once more spilled forth. It was the back door to a restaurant. Well, I bolted toward it. I ran past a tired employee who splashed garbage on me as we lightly collided. Fortunately, Big Ray was slow, in mind as well as body, so it took him a moment to register the situation, decide what to do, and act. The Scorpion was not slow but he'd tripped over the remains of my bike and was even more pissed. Oh, great. Now I was definitely going to be tortured and eventually murdered. Still, I did my best to delay that fate as I dodged into the kitchen. The faintly fishy smell of Asian cuisine nearly overwhelmed me as I dodged through the kitchen and slipped and slid along the wet floor. Big Ray wasn't so lucky. He slipped on the slick surface and fell. I looked back in time to see him catch his fall on his right hand, his gun hand. Well, I knew it was his gun hand because it was filled with a gun. However, I could see the pain on his face as his arm gave way. Apparently, 350 pounds coming down on a wrist joint may cause it to break. I didn't know whether to cheer or cry. Another broken bone on my tab with these guys. I almost took a wrong turn into a storage area, but an employee was in the way. He gawped at me jaw hanging loose and hands fumbling with the items he carried. I slowed and carefully entered the dining area of the restaurant. I didn't want any more attention, and I knew that Escorpion was unlikely to shoot me in the middle of a restaurant with ten or fifteen witnesses. At least, that's what I hoped. As I passed the aquarium near the front entrance, bullets impacted the glass and the water and the poor fish burst out onto the floor. 
Yeah, better them than me, I thought, as I ducked and scampered around the front wall and out of the front door. The scorpion hadn't needed to chase me into the dining area. He'd simply stopped at the kitchen doorway and sent bullets to do his work. I ran out onto the sidewalk. The light was better to my right, so I took off in that direction. I didn't care where I was going, just away from the bullets and murderous thugs. I expected either a scorpion or Theo to run over me at any moment. I took a few more turns and finally had to slow to catch my breath. I was no runner. I saw a patch of darkness to my right and heard the rush of water. It was one of those pedestrian bridges over a drainage creek. Oh, right direction. The lights on either end were out, and the shadows were deep, but I needed to get out of the way of the hunters. A little darkness might be my friend. I crossed out onto the bridge and paused. I leaned on the rail, just catching my breath. As the harsh sounds of my own breathing faded back to normal, I heard a new sound from under the bridge. And my first thought was, oh, druggy camp. But the sounds didn't seem natural. The chill came into me and stayed in my bones. I heard wet, slavering noises coming from just over the edge of the rail, a heavy panting and an intake of breath into enormous lungs. The drop-off was a good twelve or more feet to the water in the creek, yet the head that rose in the darkness to gaze at me from just under the rail was clearly attached to a body that stood in the water. The heavy, slime-covered hand that reached over the rail from the darkness the hand with the foot-long razor claws, was there to finish the job that Jaguar's turds were unable to do. I backed against the opposite rail, as though those few feet would make a difference to this gargantuan beast. No place to flee. Freezing was out of the question. Fight! I had a knife. No, I had a gun. I had no time to curse myself for not checking the thing earlier, but it was now time to do or die. Fortunately, the monster was in no hurry, and although its blazing orange-yellow eyes reached to just below the rail, it had to awkwardly reach over it, like a small child reaching onto a counter to find a cookie. Huge, but not huge enough. Maybe short arms. Hard to tell with a blacker-than-black monster against a very dark backdrop. Oh, probably not too bright either, I thought smugly as I pulled the pistol from my pocket. I pointed at the eyes and started blazing away at the thing. Damn, an actual troll from under a bridge. On well, my mind, insanely gibbered, as I fired the five remaining rounds into the lump of a face. Six rounds between those and the one that had taken out Arania. Damn, the magazine would have held thirteen. Feo is truly a dumbass. I was now out of rounds, and my sanity was soon to empty from my mind as the rounds had from the pistol. The hand that pulled back over the rail to shield what passed for a face on that thing. I flung the pistol over the rail in between where the eyes of the beast had resided. I heard the wet slap as it struck, followed by a splash as the water absorbed and obscured that little piece of evidence. The sounds were probably my imagination, as I was already at the far end of the bridge and beating feet towards the next working streetlight, my ears ringing from the gunshots. I again slowed to a walk after a few more turns. The chill had finally faded. I was getting pretty warm. However, I'd figured out what to do. Stay on the path of light. Follow the brightest lights on the pathway home. When I did this, all was well. When I was tempted to look into the shadows, dark figures with fiery eyes stared hatred and menace towards me, and I caught the faint clatter of hooves and hard feet rapidly approaching. I might even have heard hounds baying. Oh, well, I followed the lights and I was at the edge of my neighborhood. Just a few blocks from home. Yeah, sure, the Fosters, the Hearns. They'd given me a home and I had just started to appreciate that for the first time in many years. Then the bright headlights blinded me and the roar of a pair of engines sounded as Fio and his Scorpion closed in from a side street. I was in a brightly lit four-way intersection. Oh, great. So close, but it would end here. No way to avoid the showdown. No torture, though, I decided as I pulled out my own knife. A long kitchen affair that I had kept hidden in a leg sheath inside my pants leg. The scorpion piled out quickly. 
bit grey rather slowly as he gingerly cradled his right wrist in a makeshift sling. Hard to see such a big man display vulnerability. Feo had picked up a new partner, so much for his brother, Harania. I couldn't recall this guy's name. He looked like a rat that had decided to walk upright, grown to 5'6", and joined a street gang, <laughs> like Splinter from the Mutant Turtle Show. Feo smiled hideously through the new gap in his teeth. I told you, you were gonna die. The scorpion gritted through his still intact teeth that were grotesquely covered with a gold grill. Yeah, you fucked up my ride. I might have killed you quick, but now you gotta pay. Big Ray just looked pained and serious, but he gripped his pistol in his left hand. Splinter didn't have any particular axe to grind. He was just along for the hate ride, but he pointed a Tech-9 vaguely in my direction. They lined up in the street like some freak show version of the Earps in an old western movie. His scorpion gritted out in his best movie gunslinger voice. You put down that knife, boy, and come with us. You can ride with me in the car, you fucked up. Big Ray may even let you sit on his lap. Theo gave what passed for a laugh with him. Splinter swallowed and gaped, and Big Ray looked confused and a little nervous. Then I saw that closing in faster than they were was the darkness. That stitching gloom again. The rumble and thunder of hooves and hard feet and the distant baying of hounds on the chase. Shadowed figures took form and writhed and raised arms and hands and claws in a nightmare throng that crowded in behind the crew of killers. It took a moment for Einstein and <laughs> Scorpion to notice the changes. After a moment, just as he connected a synapse and started to speak, his comrades finally registered the encroaching darkness and the figures within it. Again, like a movie, they all turned round in unison and peered into the frantically dancing dark that was upon them. A dark made of hunters from the realm of nightmares, blazing eyes, razor claws and rows of gnashing teeth, heads crowned with antlers and horns, hard feet and hooves, so many of each, came into focus and sounds began to emerge from the maelstrom of inky figures. Grizzly, snapping and clashing, baying, snarling, howling, and a chittering laughter of pure devilish delight shattered the silence over Jaguar's unheroic crew of hunter killers. They screamed in unison, and three of them fired the weapons they clutched. Feo had Arania's knife clutched in his own good hand. He dropped it as his good hand fell limply to his side. I noticed a satisfying puddle form near his right boot, and the screaming abruptly halted. The other sounds faded and then stopped but the darkness did not dissipate. An enormous figure stepped forward. His head was crowned in antlers, yet he was clearly a man. The other beings huddled in behind him, each anthropomorphic in some way. The giant pointed at the gangsters and his minions swarmed forward to shred the would-be hunters with the teeth, claws and other appendages of the true hunters. When they were done, there was nothing but a few shreds of flesh and bone and satisfied belches that could be heard from some of the hunters and hounds. Then the antler-crowned hunter turned his head to face me. He rumbled in a thousand voices in one. Tonight, you were to be our prey. These mortal fools tried to take you in their own feeble version of the true hunt. I give you credit for making it past midnight, and since my pack has satisfied their hunger, you shall have respite. Until the next hunter's moon. Then at midnight we shall resume this hunt and finish it. If you survive until dawn, you will be free. Oof, I had no idea how to reply. I didn't even know if he wanted a reply. Then I realized what I was seeing and hearing. Maybe all the pressure tonight had caused me to snap. Well, it could be like I thought earlier. Some type of drug on the knife or something someone slipped to me. This had to be an illusion. And with that, the cacophony of hooves and hard feet and skittering claws began once more, and the darkness receded, to be replaced by a normal nightscape with all the light pollution a city boy could want. I stood there, astonished and, I'm sure, gaping like a fool. After a while, I started to walk toward home, 
but stopped by another spot first, my stash. I took out the jewellery that belonged to the Fosters, Mr. and Mrs. Hearn. I stuffed it in my pockets and took it home and sneaked in through the front door. Mrs. Hearn had left a dinner plate for me in the icebox. The next day, I surreptitiously returned the pieces to Mrs. Hearn's jewellery box. Over the next couple of weeks, I pretty much kept quiet and did some chores around the place. I avoided the streets and going into the nearby hood at all costs. I ran a few errands for the Hearns, mostly during the daytime. The gangs had likely returned to business, as usual. The Gentian Jaguar's crew made him more interested in a peaceful solution. As a mere courier, I had been forgotten in the mix. I made no attempts to remind any of them that I existed. Apparently, someone had stolen or just taken back the SUV and beat her at the front of the neighbourhood. Then, one evening in early October, Mrs. Hearn needed something from the store. It was only a few blocks, so I volunteered to go get it. No, ma'am, I have some money. I'll get it for you. She smiled tightly and nodded, perhaps a hopeful look on her face. Hope that I had turned a corner. I'd come to realize that these people actually cared about me. For no reason other than I existed and was a guest in their home. I had to stomp down my initial cynical thought of <laughs> suckers. Well, it was dark out, but I didn't worry. The streets were well lit, at least on the path I needed to follow. I rode my new bike. A high quality one I'd bought to ride come the next full moon. When I got back, the little house was dark and silent, and I feared the worst. Damn, the monsters, shadow fiends or mortal ones, had decided to take me after all, and maybe taken or harmed the herns first. I crept up the front steps, and as quietly as possible I opened the front door. It was unlocked, which was unusual. Oh crap, they've already taken them, I thought fearfully as I stepped in and quickly stepped to one side of the door, crouched and prepared. A small group shouted, Happy Birthday! as the lights came on. Well, I nearly fainted. It was a surprise 18th birthday party. The Hearns and a few of their relatives and friends greeted me. Mr. Hearn took pity at the look on my face, swept me over to the punch bowl and handed me a cup. I hadn't had a birthday party, one that I was ready to appreciate since my folks had died. I wasn't quite sure how to act, but... I managed to get through the ordeal. I think I may even have had just a little... just fun. So, now, here I am sitting in Centennial Park, one foot resting on my dark painted bike. The night's clear, and the air is crisp, if not clean. The clock on my phone display indicates 11.59. I had a small backpack with me. Just some things I'd need to keep up the pace for the hopefully long night ahead. I'd seriously consider just going down to the army recruiter like Mr. Gosling had so many years previously. Maybe the hunt wouldn't follow me that far. Yet, I had to see first. I had to know for sure that the hunters were just in my mind. Something else had surely happened that night a month ago. Maybe I'd outrun the turds and simply imagined the final confrontation. Maybe they caught me and I was in a coma dream. Maybe I just freaked out and lost my mind. Then, I heard something in the distance. A rumble, and the thunder of hooves and hard feet, and the baying of hounds coming towards me through the scant trees of the city park. <laughs> Time to ride. So another brilliant, brilliant story there from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all to you. And that has been such an absolutely essential part of this channel from pretty much the very beginning. I mean, I set up the subreddit a long time ago, not long after I um, started reading stories. And uh, there's been a steady flow of wonderful stories uh, from you. And uh, without that, it's, I don't know where I'd be, to be honest. Now, a lot of other channels do the 
big ones, the popular ones, the upvoted ones from No Sleep and uh, Let's Not Meet, things like that. And yeah, I've done my fair share, but that's not really what I've been all about. So thank you again for sticking with me when I haven't necessarily done the most popular ones that you might be out there looking for. Hope I've been entertaining you well enough anyway. Well, that's definitely enough for me for one evening, but of course I'll be back again very soon. So until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store. Pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay?